Thank you very much. <laughs> and for those of you that uh, are not in Puerto Rico, uh, I just want to let you know it's like 32 degrees Fahrenheit out there, raining. It, it looks like maybe snow. So if you're not in Puerto Rico, it's 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 really okay. You're, you're doing good. Uh, maybe maybe I. Uh, Maybe a fuss. So my name's Paul Sale, and um, I've had a, a a great life in academia. I started my life out as um, a program coordinator for a distance education program in um, special education. And back in '86, we we didn't have the internet. We had to shoot um, signals up to the, to the satellite and download, uh, there were download sites all over the uh, country and, and US. We may have had one in Puerto Rico. I don't know, it was a pretty successful program. Um, and the, that was my first introduction kind of the distance education. And you know that in distance education, particularly uh, if it's asynchronous, I had to make this long title so I can remember my points to talk. Um, in asynchronous uh, instruction, one of the most difficult things is to have a student interaction between the instructor and the students and between this diverse array, uh, dispersed array of students, right? So, uh, I've been focusing over the last couple of years on trying to figure out how to increase that interaction. Because in my experience, and in the experience of many others, as you can see from literature, uh, that really helps in the learning cycle. Now, I'm just, uh, how many instructional designers are here? Instructional designers, anybody? How about uh, faculty members? How many faculty members? Good. How about uh, administrators? Okay, good. How about uh, people that wear like six hats? Where, where, yeah. where, 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 where. If you're interested in uh, social annotation, that's what this is going to be about. I have created a HETS 2023 social annotation course in perusal. So if you go to perusal.com, Log into perusal.com and enter uh, when they ask you what course you want to join, you can join that. You can do that now or you can do it later. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But um, I wanted you to get a student feel of how uh, the social annotation works. Now, a couple caveats as I, I start. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be talking about several different vendors. No vendor has given me money. <laughs> uh, no vendor, I, I actually haven't talked to any vendors, okay? Uh, so this is not a promotion for any particular um, software platform. Uh, this is what, uh, at this phase in my investigation, this is what we would call scholarship of practice. I was the instructor for all the courses, okay? And I say that because uh, I want you to know that uh, I didn't take any information that I wouldn't have access to as the instructor. Uh, it was conducted in an ed educational setting, you know, using normal practices. Social annotation has become uh, quite quite the normal practice. Back to my um, back to my early days um, when we would shoot things up to the satellite if we would bring them down in specific rooms there were people in those rooms and they could interact with each other right they, uh, based on the content that was coming over uh, in early internet based education remember those special rooms those uh, uh, distance education rooms where you you go from one room to the other room and there were people in both rooms, and their action was there. The demand now from the market, as I see it, um, student market, particularly the adult student market and graduate level education, is 
totally dispersed and asynchronous. Okay, let me, let me do one thing here. I just wanted to tell you that our institution is an HSI institution. And uh, we have a, a, in the cohort that I'm going to be talking about, it's about 84% Hispanic. And uh, the, the first language of, of uh, many of those folks was Spanish, not English. And this will be a couple parent why well, that's important uh, soon. But um, let's see what else large. I have 100 students. In each course, uh, I am blessed with a um, academic coach who helps with grading, so that helps me a little bit. And um, it's graduate level, it's in special education. Let's see here. Uh, I'm just going to uh, just quote a few uh, a few of those. There's, there's a growing body of literature. In, and social annotation. And we know that uh, when students annotate texts, that they learn more. And this was demonstrated in 2010 by Sue et al. <laughs> when, I was, when I was thinking about social annotation, I went back, I wonder, I wonder who first analyzed text. And I came across, I didn't, I didn't, didn't say, but I came across it was about 8,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, you know, the uh, indigenous people would draw something on the cave. And then when the nomad people came out, they would draw something too in response to that annotation, right? So that the indigenous uh, folks would learn from the uh, more nomad folks. Um, Let's just talk. I'm going to be talking about social annotation here, and um, that's here's here's what uh, Novak calls it: type of technology um, for information sharing, peer interaction, knowledge construction, and collaborative meaning making. And I think that's important in learning, don't you? You know, it's really early for me. I'm, I'm sorry, it's like I teach online asynchronous. All my students are online, and I so usually I'm usually sleeping at this time. So I hope that you won't mind. Okay, uh, that I uh, have a little break. Thank you. Okay. Oh, by the way, I have no connection with Starbucks except <laughs> I, I feel like um, I don't have the company. Now, when, when these dispersed classes started, we were all very interested in using um, uh, off-the-shelf technology. Here's another, here's another uh, site here from Collier in 2020, uh, read, active reading of uh, its visible Munger group and thereby enabling socially situated. First draft and I just just put this up on his academic presentation. I figured we need some sites. But what I'm really interested in is what off-the-shelf things can we use to promote this uh, interaction between students? Anybody know what this is? Raise your hand if you know what this is. What is it? What learning management systems this kind of work? Blackboard, right? <laughs> okay, right. So we all know that many of the learning management systems now have um, Blackboard uh, or have discussion boards embedded in them. And when I first started this uh, online, this, these seven week dispersed courses in the graduate program at a largely Hispanic institution, um, this is what I use, okay? And I would place a prompt, and I'll, I'll show you a prompt that, uh, that was promoted back in 2013 that I grabbed on and I thought it was real good. I'll place a prompt, 
I'd have the students post their initial response to the prompt, and I would have other students, three, three other students, reply to that. Now, that's a pretty typical technique in distance education, instructional uh, learning. Okay. Now, here's the, here are the prompts I use. And this, this, I've got the next slide, here's the site. But, you know, this was pretty typical. One, two, three, why well, would uh, identify a point in concept? Why do you believe that? Um, apply what you've learned in four. Now, I will tell you the tool I'm going to show you takes a, a slightly different track. You notice that these are more comprehensive metacognitive activities. And so I will still use some of these. These are metacognitive activities. And uh, because it helps people put their, um, put their thoughts together about all the material that they've read. I also remember the time, uh, oh, there, there it is. Use verbatim, that's the site. The, I uploaded this uh, PowerPoint to the Google Docs. Y'all have that? Yeah, y'all have access to the Google Docs, right? Yeah, okay, so yeah. And uh, Marianne Weimer from Teaching uh, teaching for Professors suggested uh, this uh, thing. Um, about five or six years ago, people understood this need for interaction and social interaction more and more. And so, uh, some of us went to Facebook, right? Because you can create a private Facebook group. And now there's WhatsApp, uh, Snapchat, uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and we used off the shelf, it didn't cost anything to, to generate this discussion, create a private group and do it. That worked. That worked pretty well, except, except, oh man, when you use Facebook, people are looking. And although we thought Facebook was pretty secure, of course it was not, it, it is not. And people, you know, hacked that. And some of our students didn't have Facebook. Um, they would have to get Facebook, and then Facebook would collect all the data on everything you said because it is meta and their, their business is data. So I stopped that. No more Facebook groups. Huh? There was also there was also something called what they call that precious FERPA. 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 There's always that FERPA problem, right? Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, right? That you do not want to violate, okay? And, what, and uh, at our university, like every university, there are people that help us stay out of jail. So if they see a perp of violation, don't let us know. And at our university, it's usually gentle at the first lap. Second lap, it gets a little more extensive. So most recently, some platforms have been developed that allow us to, within our Blackboard course and Canvas and Design there with all those, uh, do some uh, social annotation. Oh, by the way, I, I hope you do this because I do this. I am trying to convert all of my work over to open source. I'm, I'm, so these pictures are open source. I uh, click, I click a link and it shows up on Facebook that I use these things. And yeah, because you can get some good things from Unsplash if you haven't uh, done that. Uh, I'm, I converted one research course completely to uh, open educational resources, and it really helps a lot in this because I can post them up and that they're open. They're, They've got the Creative Commons license. So now, now we're into the made for educational systems, made for professors and students 
um, platforms. And that's where we are. We've been for the last couple of years, couple of three years. I was a little you know, slow coming on board, but, but um, the two most prominent um, platforms known are uh, perusal and hypothesis. I'm grateful that at our university, uh, we have links to, um, to each of those. And uh, I haven't used hypothesis so that to, to, today, all the information I've given to you is from perusal. If you go to perusal.com, if you're at home, if you're in the audience, if you go to perusal.com and want to give up a little bit of your information and you participate in this course right here. It's a demo course. You can get the feel of how a student, a student might uh, feel. I embed, uh, let me see what's next. Uh, I go back to um, I embed I embed content within the perusal course. I tell Blackboard that that content's there. Magic happens if the mice have been fed, uh, and it connects, and things uh, things get schooled. And I'm not going to. My purpose here today was not to show you the application because. I thought you could go look at it yourself. Um, my purpose was to look at some of the analytics that I've been able to gather and what they mean or could mean. I actually ended up a lot of questions as I was doing this presentation that I did answers. So we're going to talk about perusal. I did something very bad. You might have to turn me into the uh, the compliance office. Okay, I'm teaching a I'm teaching an applied behavior analysis course. So we teach Skinnerian behavior analysis, antecedent behavior consequences. The first assignment for my students, my hundred students was to view a video on the ethical issues with applied behavior analysis past and present. And the person presenting is totally against applied behavior analysis. Smart guy, uh, actually it's three panels that would just say, this is really hurting students with disabilities applied behavior analysis. Now, why would I do that? Well, of course you wouldn't. In this age, we have forgotten how to look at both sides of things, I believe, particularly when it comes to social media, okay? And so I wanted to give them an idea of uh, what the other side of the argument was, because the rest of the course primarily is, you know, do this, do this, do this, and then this, this will happen, right? So, so my students in the first module click, click on a link in Blackboard. It takes them to a video and that video plays and they can have, they can annotate, uh, make comment at each place in the video, at certain timestamps and everything. And then the other people can see who said what, and they can respond to those people. So it is a conversation. It is a conversation. And I have found that the conversations are much deeper using perusal than they are with discussion boards. Now, it could be the prompts I use with discussion boards are more global as opposed to specific uh, a specific text. Here's the instructions they got with this. Present, pre presents the views of the speakers. These are just some views and may be controversial. Please comment throughout the video and respond to others who have commented. 
if you send me a comment and perusal with an article citation that refutes to support these authors' opinions, I'll add five bonus points. So what I was trying to do, of course, was to get additional liter literature that supports or refutes. And then all the students can build their a library of a five and a half uh, behavior analysis articles in this um, in this one document. You can see it has a it has a time limit on it. You know, it's it opens up like on a Wednesday, closes on a Tuesday. How are we doing on time? Speaking of time and limits, I'm gonna stand back. Do that. Do that. I got 20 minutes. Okay, good. Because I, I get to the part that I like the most, and that's the, the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, here here um, is an example of how the students responded in perusal. There were 1,055 comments. Why does it do that? Why does Siri do that? It's <laughs> always listening. It's listen. My wife said she wasn't going to be here today. <laughs> oh man. So so as you can see, about 90, 91 percent of the uh, people completed the work um uh, with maximum school. And you can see the rest of them. I mean, look at the depth of conversation that one happened. And the unanswered questions aren't to me because I answer any question to me, but these are questions they just pose kind of out in the air. And I can take a look at it. Little, I can actually see in the analytics, again, I'm, I'm not Talk, I don't want to talk about the mechanics of it. I can see in the analytics uh, keywords that came up the most in the, res in the responses and where the most questions were around certain keywords. And now, this verges on artificial intelligence. I don't know whether it's called machine learning or artificial intelligence or what. I'm not going to get into the debate. If you logged into my course, you saw something about chat GPT. Right? You saw something about chat. Oh, okay. Hello. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. I was going to tell my assistant to do it. But... Um, so there's some this is this is great. I, I haven't figured this out. I'm trying to figure this out. You don't want one hour and 38 minutes. This allows me to download every comment. By everybody with their names or stuff. I've stayed away from the, uh, anything that would get you very close to a student just because, as I'll tell you later, I'm going to take this into a real study um, a little later. And I'm going to go through the eyes. Uh, we had somebody posted 38 comments, somebody posted 33 comments, somebody posted 31. These are the overachievers, right? Okay, there's another one that I that I didn't show um, uh, is where because it showed zero, you know, the low, the lowest amount of comments. Some of them were zero, some of them were one or two. I can tell you that's what they said. Some so there was all, kind of a range, and I'll I'll show you that in a minute. But this this right here, this is just out of the program. If you want to do in-depth analysis, you have to download it and put something in the spreadsheet. The video was about, I can't remember the video. I think it was about 105 zero minutes. 105 zero minutes. From perusal, I can see that, uh, I can see how long it took them, how long they kept it open, viewing time. And you can you can think what would a student do to keep the viewing time open? Well, they'd open it up, close the window, and then go back to play uh, whatever they're playing, right? And that's true; they can do that. 
I mean, that's true. But Caruso also collects, I forget what the time interval is, but it samples time intervals. And if there's been no movement on the page, um, they don't get active engagement time. So that's the difference between these two. Each row, by the way, represents a student group. Student A, student B, student C. So this is collected on every student. It is available without doing any other anything else, just going to the Caruso dashboard. Um, Caruso allows upvotes. So if somebody likes a comment, upvoted, allows downvotes. I don't know if it allows downvotes. It just allows upvotes. Um, in this trigger happy world, they probably just upvotes. Um, what, uh, and it gives me the total word count and average per annotation. I'm not one that, and I'm sure you're not either, uh, because we're a good instructor in here. You're not one that holds somebody to a particular word count. Uh, to, uh, as I tell my students, because they always want to know well, how long does it have to be? You've experienced that, right? How long does it have to be? Well, I don't know. Some people can say it in a short amount of time. Some people, it takes longer, right? That's what happens. So I don't know all that. I just want to show you some of the analytics here. And um, just to give you a flavor of the nature of comments, this is, this is a conversation that was flowing about the video. It's interesting experience this author that one of the presenters had an uh, author. And then, uh, you know, this person got two upvotes, and they can see that. They can see it. In fact, if they, if they put, uh, uh, if they get upvotes, they get a better grade. So that encourages the students to write provocative comments. Okay. Um, so I think these are, I think these are reasonably deep questions. They're not. I agree with Dr. Daniels. You know, remember that in the discussion. I agree with so and so. Right. That's what happened. They don't get a lot of points if they uh, just agree. So that's kind of the conversation looks like. Um, I just put some, I put some stats here so you could uh, say, here's a guy that went. And played a video game, or a woman that played a video game with while the program was open because he had 8,616 minutes of viewing time, right? Forgot. Right, right, right. He forgot. He didn't close it out. Okay. The, uh, the median amount of viewing time was 318 minutes, which is about five hours for the video. So I know they spent about that on there. Um, you know, um, the average was whatever it is. <laughs> this is the average on clearly. Uh, now on the active engagement time, which is a much better, much better measure, the median was 79 minutes. 126 was the most frequent, so that's two hours, which would be about 16 minutes longer than the video is. So I'm suspecting these people went in, opened the video annotated as they went through and then um, finished out. So it's slightly longer than the video. I, I, I gained word counts. Again, word counts aren't that uh, really important. What I find that is useful for me in this is um, number of annotations, posted, response, I don't give them, oh, there, I did, I did include that. And I even read that to people's faces. There's, the machine does this. They call it a confusion report. I don't really see it as a confusion report. <clears throat> well, I guess that I could see why they call it that. These are the things I need to hit on here in order so I'll, I'll do some additional instruction based on these comments. And again, I didn't have to go through the, how many, 1,035? 
machine went through a thousand thirty five comics and figured out that uh, here were some of the and I think it, it's a question bunch where you saw this question. Universities around the world are trying to scale courses up, increase student programs to, um, to generate more employment and more income. And I understand it really that really I've been in roles where that's been very important. Okay, and I understand what happened. I am so grateful to our president. Over COVID, when everybody else was tanking, somehow our uh, somehow our enrollment was growing. Remember, they did it. I don't know, not at that level. So I'm very sensitive to that. But there comes to be a time when you have to ask yourself ethically: Can I manage a hundred students in a graduate course? With the amount of fidelity and interaction that I need. Our this graduate course in seven weeks, they go through a whole book. It is like a it is like a full semester. It's a seven-week graduate course. So they go through the 14 chapters of the book just like they would if it was a long chapter, or you know, whatever, whatever readings. It's a thousand point. Um, it's a thousand point course. Most of these individual assignments rank between 10 and 20 points. Now, this is this is why this program is particularly useful to me. I can set the parameters on how the machine can grade the responses. Okay. And this, this is developed by somebody at Harvard, um, which is really good or bad, but um, seems to do a pretty good job because when I go back and look at the scoring, see, I, look, at, look at all of these uh, uh, things that, that the machine measures. And I can set these percentages to what I want. Now, you'll notice that the percentages add up to more than 100. And that's okay with me. I did that because I don't want a person being deemed too bad if they miss one of the metrics. So there's a they can't get they can't get extra credit for hitting all the metrics, but they they do. So this is AI from an instructor from an instructor's position. This is AI at work in my view. Maybe the machine learning. It's certainly not as smart as Siri. But it is uh, very helpful to me. Now I can ethically assign readings, knowing that I can grade their responses to the readings with some utility. For me, I'll wrap this up and give you a chance to ask some questions, or maybe we'll go on and look at the course. Um, anecdotally, um, much deeper but more narrow than the global set of questions I showed you. Uh, absolutely more comments since the full, remember how many comments do I have to make in order to get a full grade? Remember that question? I don't tell them. <clears throat> I can set it. In fact, I set it small to start with, and then I increase it but they do not know. And that is behaviorism, by the way. <laughs> um, and they don't know how many comments. So they comment as best they can on what excites them. And most people, as you could, as you could see in that one metric on this, that you're going to learn more than 90% of the people got the full credit. Um, now, my next set of research is, is going to try to look at the qualitative differences of the comments, maybe um, the um, 
parameters with the different parameters. To, I haven't done that. I wanted to go in and take a look at the at the perusal scores versus other measures that are hand graded, or maybe do a AD test, maybe do a hand grade and whatever. But in order to do that, I would normally do that in my courses. So I, I need to go through the hobby to do that. Uh, and I will. So I just love this picture. This picture is a tunnel. It's kind of dark, uh, but it's a, a tunnel. I'm pretty much saying. So, uh, how many of y'all have got into the forest? Anybody get into the forest? I got into the forest. Um, I can tell you that in our institution, if you've gone into the course, you, you'll see an article on um, Chat GPT. Anybody know what that is? Chat GPT. It's a, it's a artificial intelligence that you can give work prompts to, and it'll write for you, write a paper. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the clickbait you see on the internet when you you see these things put out by Forbes and things that have a lot of numbers. They've been using artificial intelligence for a while to, to generate that. The most, there's some, there's some really polarizing comments about whether or not we should let students use chat. There have been, and there will be, some polarizing comments about whether we should let instructors use our version of chat GPT to automatically grade something. Right? Because that's what I did here. I automatically graded students' responses using machine learning based on parameters I set. And so the question is, you know, how far do we go? <clears throat> I'm going to, I actually, for my sister, I've got a bias. That's what I do. I told my students to use chat GPT to answer their essay questions on the first quiz. I said, but you better check chat GPT to make sure it's right because it's often not and it's often old. But here's my line of thinking when I was a doc student doing all my research, I had to look at, you know, you know, remember those boxes, uh, those books you had to open up and, you know, you look up keywords, right? And then you'd open up a book and you find out the articles that related to those keywords and then you'd go to the microfiche, right? Now we do it in Boolean search. We do a Boolean search in a very large database and um, it, um, to me, that's, Artificial intelligence doing our work for us. We've we've actually accepted it in academia. So I don't know what all the all the hype is about, um, but we've actually accepted that. I mean, heck, uh, EndNote, uh, Zotero, all of those programs, they'll automatically format your sites for you, right? And they'll do it in multiple uh, in multiple ways. You just ask it to do it. I mean, that's is that cheap? Is that cheating? I don't think so. But anyway, I'm going to stop now because I got my five minute queue and <laughs> I'll open it up for questions. Questions from the uh, far as well as questions from the near. We'll start with the question with the Albians and then Zoom question. Okay, sorry. I, questions from the near, then questions <laughs> from the far. <laughs> Yes, I got a question regarding integration in the mention Blackboard as your. Uh, yeah, we use Blackboard. And then, and then how do you integrate? Was I new to this with the. Our wonderful the people are. I've been the, in the head of it here, and I'm not looking up because I don't need to, but um, I've been at a bunch of institutions. We have the best team, and they create what's called an LTI. Mm -hmm which I guess is some little snippet of code mm -hmm. that makes them talk. Like a widget. Yeah, well, it's kind of, yeah, like a widget. 
So this transfer the score. I'll use the score of these one to ten, but whatever the score of the assignment is, it will take the percentage in in perusal. Like if somebody got a five and the assignment was actually worth twenty, then in Blackboard it'll show a ten because it was fifty percent. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and you have to. I mean, there's there's some time doing it. I uh, some of my colleagues laugh at me because every uh, every time I offer a course, I go in module by module, add in new material and change things. So it can get time for the student. But I mean, what do you know? Old man like me, what am I going to do, right? I'm not conducting field research now. I'm just trying to have my uh, instruction. Questions, other questions? Any other questions? <clears throat> yeah. So what is the, the students? Saying about this, do they see more like integrated or be more in each into the course? I have a survey that I administered last semester, so it's not on this course. It was the first semester that I, I did it, and I made a mistake when I posted the stuff because I had 108 students in, and I forgot to tell the machine to put them in small groups of 10. So the most frequent comment is. It was really hard to read because there were 100 annotations and he had, you know, each person had to do whatever. And, uh, but other than that, they liked it because it, they were able to see what their, um, what their uh, colleagues would say. I, there's a question, and I'll share that data with you. I've got the spreadsheet. You know, how, uh, how, how likely are you, how easy was it? And people said it was very easy. How likely are you to use it on short assignments? Likely to very likely, predominantly, with a notable number of somewhat to not like. Okay. So, but this was new to them. So, there's another tool they got to learn. Yeah. Okay. Sharing with you the about when you talk about the block discussion mm -hmm. uh, option for the student. I use that with uh, my high school student. Mm -hmm. And for them, we need to like uh, give a specific instruction, especially to respect the other one point of opinion, point of view. So they say, and when I monitor the, the, the discussion, they say any comment in which, because you have a teaching business, and I say you have to use the business vocabulary word. It's not like a, uh-huh, LOL. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And I say, if you submit something about that, I will going to delete that comment because that is not the appropriate business vocabulary word today. If you say to a customer, mm -hmm, <laughs> what do you understand? And this, you know, many, uh, a number of the studies on the circular annotation have been used for A through 12. By the way, this mm -hmm. machine will tell me if there's a mm -hmm. inappropriate comment. And the other one is that, well, that, uh, GPT chat. Uh -huh. uh, many educators will refuse that one. I would say to the student, welcome. Welcome that because the chat is not about the research or a specific words on this. I need, when I evaluate that one, I say the topic is what to evaluate your personal opinion about that. In some cases, I use a real world experiences, a real world topic, news that happened in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Today in the morning, we wake up with this news. Okay, go to the GPT and say to GPT to say about specific in San Juan in Ponce. Probably like GPT, they don't know about that. They don't know. So you, have, you don't have option. And if the GPT is saying something to you, great, no problem. I need to know your opinion, your contact in, uh, in contradiction with what? With what we discussed right here in, in the classroom. Because sometimes I say to the student, the book show Disney World. Disney World, and that for the books all are amazing. Yes, that's not the reality in the customer service world and the and the real world. And I try to, to for they connect what with what we discuss in the class that the GPT they don't know what we discuss in the class. Yes, GPT, uh, you know the database of words in mm -hmm. 21, 2021 uh, is when they create the large data bank. I hear that they have to start charging for it. a month or two. <laughs> Even though it's open, these are kind of questions from the field. No questions. There are no questions from the field. <laughs> <laughs>
Zero. Interaction time. Zero. Oh. No, no, that means that you are a good teacher. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you guys for being here and for listening to me ramble a bit. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with any of you personally about any of this. Uh, don't forget to go to your um, your your thing here. I'm doing your job for your thing here and evaluate this session. And I want to give a. I really want to say this, uh, and I want to say it while I'm there too, because they can't see it. But I can tell you that the head folks, the staff, you police, uh, uh, and, and all of them. I just done a tremendous job with this conference, and I really appreciate that. I was with her in 2006 here, and so I saw it right kind of at the beginning when she was starting, and she has done such a transformation. And so it is great to be back with you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.